Welcome to our last video of the semester and last video in our tropical cyclone motion series. Here we want to describe a few remaining factors that influence tropical cyclone motion. So let's go ahead and dig in. So a little bit of context and really a summary of where we've been through the course of this video series. Recall that that vertically weighted large scale wind accounts for 60 to 80 percent of a tropical cyclone steering flow. And the beta effect that we described in the previous slide, uh, slideshow accounts for another 10%. So we're already starting at 70 to 90%, a very large percentage of the overall steering flow. But there are other factors that we can consider and other factors that we won't consider that can account for the remaining 10 to 30% of this variation in tropical cyclone motion. So some of these other factors include the non-uniformity of the horizontal flow across the cyclone. To this point, this idea of a large scale wind, we've sort of averaged Averaged it across the cyclone, but it's variable across the cyclone. It may be faster on one side than on the other. It may be a completely different direction on one side as compared to the other. And this does have a small effect on tropical cyclone motion. We can also consider vertical wind shear effects that have not been accounted for above in this idea of a vertically weighted large scale wind. Recall that vertical shear tends to tilt a vortex in one direction or the other. And we described before how the induced circulations can lead to the rotation or change of that tilt, maybe from one axis to another, or maybe to reduce that tilt over time. So we're going to look at a very similar process to what we described there in terms of those dynamical effects of vertical wind shear showing up here in terms of tropical cyclone motion. There's also this idea of Fujiwara rotation that dates back almost 100 years, where you have two different cyclonic features that are close enough to each other such that the wind with one can steer the other and vice versa there. So we'll introduce that as we get to the end of this video uh, here. There are also other effects, convective, so thunderstorm and or land-induced vortex redevelopment. So say you have vertical wind shear and you have a scent focused down shear uh, away from the cyclone. You're going to concentrate your heating there, which may lead to uh, cyclonic rotation redeveloping within that region and the low level center kind of jumps to the location of that convection. Or land, especially mountainous areas, where you may have cyclonic flow impinging upon one of these uh, higher land masses, you may favor convection developing on one side of the mountain or the other. Or you may just see the interaction of the cyclone with that terrain lead to the feature trying to go around that terrain rather than straight up and over. So these two factors are also important in certain cases for tropical cyclone motion but they're a little too complex for us to describe here. So we're going to focus on these first three of these other factors in the remainder of this video. So again, whether we vertically weight the horizontal wind or not, it's typically not uniform across a tropical cyclone. We know, for instance, that the wind is not the same here in Milwaukee as it usually is in Madison, yet alone over in Minneapolis. The same is true as you go from one side of a cyclone to the other. So this leads to asymmetries in vorticity advection. Again, reminding ourselves that we've used this vorticity tendency uh, related to vorticity advection approach to be able to characterize tropical cyclone motion in a quasi-quantitative fashion. So because you don't have the same wind across the cyclone, independent of the strength of the vorticity across the cyclone, you're going to get vorticity advection asymmetries. And just as we saw with the beta effect where each one of those in that nonlinear component had its own steering flow, we're going to have it, our own steering flow anomalies associated with these vorticity advection anomalies. And these can influence the steering flow that the cyclone feels beyond just that associated with the large scale wind itself. So we're going to consider two cases here. One where we have linear horizontal wind shear with no winds right at the center. And then we're going to consider one where you do have non-zero wind right across the center. And we'll go even a step further than this and we'll take a look at what happens when you add back in the beta effect. So we're going to start very simply with just this non-uniformity of the horizontal flow. Not even really considering the large scale motion uh, aspects. We're going to neglect the beta effect and then we're going to come back in and take a look at it in the context of the beta effect as well. So here's our first example, linear horizontal shear. So the change in uh, horizontal wind is linear as you go from south to north here. It is faster uh, easterly here at low levels 
and faster westerly here at higher latitudes, I should say, lower latitudes, higher latitudes. And we have our tropical cyclone here, but its center is right between the easterly and westerly flow. So we can assume, given that it's a linear change, that there is no horizontal flow associated with uh, the large scale wind at its center. So how do we know what's going to actually steer the cyclone here? If you take kind of a large scale average, all of this will cancel out and you'll get zero. But surely that's not what's gonna be the case, right? Well, let's dig in a little bit deeper. So if we take this Western, uh, easterly flow here directed toward the west on the northern half of the cyclone. We know that this cyclone is a maximum of positive vorticity, a maximum of cyclonic vorticity, cyclonic rotation. So the wind is going to uh, try to advect that cyclonic vorticity to the west. And similarly here on the south side, where you have this westerly or eastward flow, it's going to try to increase the vorticity through advection here to the southeast. Whereas on the northeast and southwest sides, the opposite is true. The wind is blowing away from those locations across the cyclonic vorticity maximum away from this location across the cyclonic vorticity maximum. So we have positive advection in this case, northwest and southeast, and negative southwest and northeast here. And we know that each one of these is going to be associated with its own unique horizontal flow anomalies. So our positive advection is associated with positive vorticity anomalies, zeta prime being positive, and thus with cyclonic flow anomalies depicted by the blue arrows. To the southwest and northeast, the opposite is true. Negative vorticity advection anomalies lead to negative vorticity anomalies themselves, zeta prime less than zero, and so anomalous anti-cyclonic flow. In this case, you create a deformation flow where you have the axis of contraction here from west to east and the axis of dilatation or expansion here from north to south. You're going to kind of try to tug at the cyclone, but you're not going to have a steering flow right across its center. These flows come to zero right at the center, just as the large scale wind did. So this here in and of itself has no effect on tropical cyclone motion for this particular particular wind field. But what about when we add the beta effect? So let's add the beta effect here. Starting from the same point here, we know that the beta effect leads to a positive vorticity anomaly on the western side and a negative vorticity anomaly here on the eastern side associated with the north to south and south to north flow respectively for the northern hemisphere. And so we have this combination, positive, 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 negative, northwest and southwest, negative, negative, and negative, positive, northeast and southeast. And so in both cases, we're looking at the features to the north having like sign anomalies. So more uh, cyclonic and more anticyclonic to the northwest and northeast, and less to the southwest and southeast here. So consequently, these two steering flows that you see in the blue arrows to the north dominate over what you see to the south. And that leads to an increase in the northern, northward steering flow across the cyclone, whereas you have a weaker impact to the south and a weakened component there. So no longer do you have these all canceling out over top of the cyclone. Now you have a weak northward directed steering flow given the combination of this non-uniform horizontal flow and the beta effect here. What about our second case? It's very similar to the first, except instead of going from a westerly wind to easterly wind, now we're dealing with westerly wind at all uh, latitudes here. And we now have a flow straight across the center from west to east here. But what of this steering flow actually is important? What of this horizontal wind is important? Is it just an average of this? Or are there unique asymmetries that result from this variation in the flow in the north to south direction? So we take the same approach as we did on the previous slide. We have negative advection to the northwest, given that you have a fast flow from west to east 
going away from the cyclonic vorticity maximum that is located here. And so we would infer that there would be positive advection here to the uh, north and east. On the south side, here we have very weak wind. This goes to zero the further south you get. And so there's very little advection here on the southeast side. The same is true on the southwest side. But here on the northeast side, you have this fast west to east wind blowing across the cyclonic vorticity maximum, across the cyclone toward this location here. So we get two stronger anomalies, negative advection northwest, positive advection northeast, and two near zero features to the south, given this particular wind field. So as before, these negative and positive advection anomalies are going to have their own flow anomalies, negative or anticyclonic to the northwest, positive or cyclonic to the northeast. And so that's what we have depicted here. So clockwise flow, counterclockwise flow. And this imparts a southward directed steering flow across the cyclone in isolation. But what about when we bring in the beta effect here? So again, keeping in mind that we have cyclonic vorticity tendency to the west due to the beta effect and anticyclonic to the east due to the beta effect, given the north to south and south to north flow that we see in those locations respectively. These counteract the signs of our anomalies here. So this is going to reduce that southerly steering component across the cyclone associated with just the nonlinear horizontal flow. So now let's dig into this idea of vertical wind shear here. In this case, in before, we have a cyclonic circulation maximum that weakens with increasing height, and then as you reach to the tropopause, becomes anticyclonic in terms of its structure. Here we have a westerly vertical wind shear. You have easterly winds at low levels, giving way to stronger westerly winds near to the tropopause. So all things considered, we would expect this feature to tilt in the vertical. The anticyclone will be deflected toward the east and the cyclone will be deflected toward the west here. And that's what we have depicted here at right. The cyclone is found to the west of the upper level anticyclone here. And so if we look between these features, so we have this blue dotted uh, set of lines here connecting the low and upper level features here. If we look sort of in their center of mass in the middle troposphere, note that the anticyclone has a wind component that is directed from south to north, and the cyclone has a wind component that is directed from south to north as well. So in this particular example, what we see is a northward directed south to north steering flow across the cyclone. So in this case, the vertical shear tilts the cyclone and its associated upper tropospheric anticyclone down shear from west to east and leads to the tilt of those features imparting a northward directed steering current across the cyclone. We can come back to our example from our tropical cyclone intensity change series as well, where we had westerly shear and we conceptualize this as a tropical cyclone that weakens in intensity, but does not necessarily become anticyclonic with increasing altitude here. So we know that we have a stronger cyclonic circulation at low levels than we do at upper levels. And each one of these induces a particular steering flow. Uh, it is a horizontal circulation that does not exist in a vacuum. This cyclonic circulation weakens but extends upward from here. This cyclonic circulation weakens and extends downward from here. And so we can depict the associated flow anomalies with the lower here depicted on the top line, and the upper, here depicted on the bottom line, tropospheric flow features. So this upper level reflection of our tropical cyclone is directed from south to north, and this lower level feature is directed from north to south. And we showed how in our intensity change series that this can change the tilt of the cyclone through changing the location of the center at different altitudes. So this is a similar process to what we were looking at on the previous slide here, but looking at it from a different perspective, changing the vortex tilt through motion rather than changing the motion or location of the vortex as a whole itself. 
Finally, we come to Fujiwara rotation, where here I have depicted two tropical cyclones and their associated cyclonic rotational flow given by the black arrows on either side here. Right now we're considering that these two cyclones are identical in size, identical in intensity, identical in strength. They're identical in every way to each other. So Fujiwara rotation at its most basic level is the steering of one tropical cyclone or really any other cyclonic feature by the wind associated with another tropical cyclone that is in close proximity to it and vice versa. So here this tropical cyclone to the west is going to be steered in part by this south to north flow on the west side of the cyclone to its east. Conversely, the cyclone to the east is going to be steered somewhat from south to north by the flow on the east side of the cyclone to its west. This requires that the two cyclones be within a certain distance of each other, about 15 degrees latitude longitude or 1500 kilometers in order for the wind field associated with one cyclone to be meaningfully large on top of the other here. So in this case, you're looking at something that's less than or equal to 1500 kilometers that in this particular configuration leads to the two rotating in this counterclockwise fashion about a common center between them. And so we get this center of mass here that is located between them, and it is around this feature that these two cyclones are going to rotate. If the two cyclones are identical to each other, as they are in this particular example, the center of mass lies exactly halfway between them. However, if the cyclones are not equal, the center of mass will lie closer to the cyclone that is overall stronger. So generally larger and or more intense, the cyclone, uh, the center of mass between the two cyclones will favor that stronger and or more intense or larger cyclone over the smaller or weaker or less intense tropical cyclone. So we can look at what this does in the context of model simulations. We're here on the left, we have an Earth relative reference frame. So if you're looking at a map like you do for any weather related application, you would see one cyclone follow this red line here and the other cyclone follow this red line that we see here. And that's assuming that there's no beta effect, that the value of Coriolis does not change in the north-south direction. Whereas if it does, we get the green lines here, where you have one cyclone coming up to the east and then north and then back to the west, and then the other cyclone coming up here to the north, west, and then south and kind of completing a small uh, counterclockwise loop here. The blue dashed line uh, that you see here is the location of the center of mass for the case where the beta of parameter is non-zero, where the beta effect actually exists. And so as the two cyclones move here for the first one and here for the second one, the center of mass moves with it to the north and to the west, as we expect from the beta effect. Whereas if the beta effect is not present, the center of mass stays right at its initial location as the two cyclones spiral inward toward that location, given that cyclonic circulations are associated with frictional induced convergence, flow coming inward toward them. And so this cyclone to the left is trying to draw the one to its right, to its east, in close to it. And in turn, this cyclone to the east is trying to draw this one to its west in closer to it. So the two features come closer to this common center of mass over the course of time. But if you look at a reference frame that moves with this center of mass along this blue line. So at each one of the times that you see depicted here by the different circles along the red or the green tracks, if you take this area relative to the center of mass, so kind of cutting out an area up here for this one here, as opposed to an area down here, for this one uh, earlier in time, you get this center of mass relative framework. And you see that it looks a lot like the beta equals zero case from the earth relative framework for both beta equals zero and beta not equal to zero. So beta equals zero should be exactly equal. The center of mass does not change. And so you should get the same exact signal because the area over which the analysis is done is constant at each one of those times. 
But in the beta is non equal to zero case, while the two cyclones are spiraling around each other and generally moving to the northwest with the center of mass, following that feature, you end up getting a track that looks nearly identical to that of the case where the beta effect is not turned on here. This helps to show that cyclonic spiraling inward associated with Fujiwara rotation here. So summarizing our key points here, the steering flow again is typically not uniform across a tropical cyclone. It's certainly not uniform in the horizontal and we know that it's vertically sheared. So even if we vertically weight it, there are some effects related to the change over that vertical distance that we are not accounting for in that concept of a large scale steering flow. These non-uniformities can influence where and how the tropical cyclone moves. And then this idea of Fujiwara rotation again, if two tropical cyclones can come close enough to each other, usually, excuse me, usually they do not. However, if they can be brought to within about 1500 kilometers of each other, they may have a weak component that brings them in closer to each other as they rotate around each other and around a common center of mass. So that really wraps up everything for tropical cyclone motion. Again, there are convective and land associated asymmetries that can lead to variance in motion under cases of vertical wind shear and landfall or near landfall respectively. However, these as well as the ones that we've described in this video are all very small components, very small contributors to tropical cyclone motion as a whole. And so consequently, we wrap up here for tropical cyclone motion. We wrap up here for the semester as a whole. Thank you for sticking with me through the course of the online portion of the semester, these last six weeks here. I hope that these videos have proved informative. I hope that they've proved useful and engaging as much as they can be. I know it's tough to spend a lot of time glued to your internet screen, uh, just trying to take all of this in when there are many distractions uh, around us. I thank you for your attention and your patience. And uh, it's been a pleasure teaching you all this semester. I only wish we had more time together in person. So thank you all. And I will see you when I see you on the flip side.